All right, why don't we go ahead and uh, get started here. My name is Baraki Ankama, and I'd like to introduce my research that's been about seven years in the making. Uh, Fifteen minutes really isn't enough time to get into any detail, so I'm going to blast right through it and give an overview, hopefully generate some interest. It, uh, one of the side effects of it is going to be, of the short time is going to be that it's, it consists of a lot of seemingly unsubstantiated statements. Uh, so please, I apologize for that, please bear with me. Uh, it is a bit pretentiously titled, Causal Induction and the Failures of Statistics, or How Humans Learn. Uh, it's important to state that thousands, if not millions, of people have worked on this very uh, same problem and met with little success, and there's nothing particularly special about me. Um, so I'd like to take that ego right out of it. The only thing that really differentiates me is that I was not actually trying to solve the human learning problem. I'm not particularly interested in it. It's very powerful, very useful. I shouldn't say I'm not interested in it. I, I definitely am. But my goal actually was to make a search engine. I wanted to kick Google's ass and make a whole lot of money. Just like Zephyrin Cochran, Star Trek reference, I cared about the dollar sign. Of course, that makes me sound evil, so I'm not going to say that too much. Uh, the search engine hasn't, hasn't succeeded yet. It's not to say that it won't. It's just you know, it might, it's still might. So, uh, without further ado, the, uh, the problem without getting into the internals of how I actually gather information or how the search engine works, the point is, is I'm ga I gathered this information off the internet and I was trying to model it inside a statistical network. These uh, networks, Bayesian, in nature, whatever, uh, they always, uh, they guaranteed a certain performance, but that performance always degenerated, it degenerated very quickly into crap. And it, it, that's not to say they weren't good at the beginning, the results were good, but they quickly, de they quickly declined given more data and, and, and over time. And I started to ask myself, and it didn't, it, it, it didn't matter which network I chose, whether it was a neural network or a Bayesian, it didn't matter what matter I propagated the information or how I managed to uh, bias or condition the network. So I started to ask myself, why? You know, why, why is this the case? It's an eternal question. Why? Why didn't it work? And, this is a question is essentially why is humans are why are humans able to do this? Uh, humans visit web pages all the time. They gather this information. Everybody everybody learns. Everybody learns quickly. Goes on with their life. But that itself is a difficult question to answer. You know, why, what is it about humans? Is it something innate? And that actually became what do humans actually learn? That itself is is a loaded question. It's a difficult question to answer. So that become, became what does any life form actually learn? And that became the uh, the much more distilled question. What is the bare minimum, the absolute bare minimum, that a life form has to learn. And I came up with an answer to that. The answer is, the life form has to learn to survive. That means to state that there are plenty of things that kill life. And you have to ask this question, what is it that kills life if you're going to learn what it is, what it has to do to survive? So there, there are two things that kill life, uh, and I've been just blasting through this, is that the second law of thermodynamics kills life, which is to state that uh, energy efficiency is the law of entropy. Uh, energy uh, loses the ability to, gain, to convert energy efficiently over time, whether that's uh, due to age or simple, simple biological design, can't do it. Uh, or there simply isn't enough energy or aggregate energy for it to convert, i.e. a volcano has moved and a colony of bacteria has died or the sun has gone white dwarf and everything dies. Now, assuming that everything is, uh, that all life form is surviving, which is a fair assumption given that we're still here, then the question becomes, what is it that kills them? And beyond the second law, and that answer comes in the, comes in the form of causality. Causality kills life, which is to state not walking underneath a rock rolling down a hill or not walking underneath uh, hanging piano, or not walking off of the edge of the cliff, or more importantly, or, or probably more concretely, not choosing not to be in the state of the world where there's a predator, like and not going to the lion's den, right? So one starts to ask themselves, uh, as a result of that, well, given that uh, things are modeled statistically, are causality and probabilism compatible? And can humans even learn probabilistically? And the answer to that is no, no, humans cannot learn probabilistically, and you can construct a very simple example as to why. So let's take uh, the example of crossing the street. Let's say, let's put a pretty low prior on it. Let's say that 90% of the time a person will cross the street successfully, whether they condition it or not on cars, who cares? That let's just assume 90% of the time. So the point is, if a person crosses the street once per day, I myself crossed 10 times on the way to campus today, they only cross the street one street per day, they cross, uh, cross seven times in a week, then the probability of survival of the street cross is 0.9 to the seventh, which is in fact slightly less than a half. So we'll just say 50% to make everybody happy. 
What this means is that given two people who cross, who cross a street equal number of times over a week, then the, the chance of survival are one of them will die of the two people. That means that humans have a half-life, given the 90% street crossing probability, of one week. You can take that, you can take that half-life, plug it into your usual equation, and end up with the idea that it takes only 32 and a half weeks to reduce the entire population of six billion people to a single man. And I don't know about you, but on the way to campus, I was not walking and stepping all over dead bodies. Now, of course, that's neighborhood dependent, and I apologize to the people who are not in good neighborhoods. Um, um, hopefully, I'm not in a bad neighborhood. You did not come to live in all that stuff. So the answer is that the world is that the answer of why and why this uh, statistical probabilistic representation of the world doesn't work is because the world itself is not probabilistic. Now, some of you are going to argue, you're going to argue right away, uh, and I'd like to shut that down by saying that the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy, is equivalent to the law of causality, which is to state that the first law implies causality, and causality implies the first law. So, some of you are overeducated, or you uh, you're know a lot, you're going to start saying that the wave equation is probabilistic. Uh, there are a number of explanations to the wave equation. Uh, this is an aside. Uh, the point is, is that any probabilistic action or, or behavior of the universe, so any unintended breach of causality, unintended meaning you, you remove the idea of God, then that results in the immediate destruction of the universe, right? Which is to state that you integrate over time, you integrate over all time, all particles, all, uh, all events of those particles, and you end up with the destruction of the universe and over continuous time. Uh, Einstein had a big problem with this incompleteness of, of uh, quantum mechanics as a probabilistic uh, and in terms of the probabilistic equation, I'm not saying quantum mechanics is wrong. There's just many interpretations. Einstein and his cohorts had a big problem with this, and they called it the incompleteness of quantum. And he tried to uh, append it with locally realized hidden variables. Um, uh, it was shut down by Bell in 19, uh, not to, 40 years ago by, by Bell's inequality theorem, and somebody, uh, Joey Christensen, has been able to uh, essentially break, break Bell's theorem by using Clifford algebra. Just Google it, uh, you know, quantum Bell's theorem and Clifford algebra. All right, so now that that aside is over, and we know that the world is not probabilistic, we can answer this question, what is causality? Well, what it isn't, as I said, is not probabilistic. It's not the shallow view of probabilism that an event has any two outcomes, that there's some distribution of outcomes from any, from any particular cause. Everybody learns that in their machine learning, statistical learning courses. That is wrong. So what it is, in fact, is that there are, uh, there's, there's the intuitive answer, the answer that everybody knows, which is the same cause in the same state of the world will yield the same outcome. It's this replicability, predictability of the world, right? So you can back, you can back away from that and state something, state the, the formal definition, which is that uh, a number of equally disruptive causes in sufficiently identical states of the world will yield identical outcomes. What that is to uh, state is, let's suppose that I take somebody in this room and I slap them. I'm not going to slap them, don't worry, you're in the front row. Nobody's in the, in the front row. Um, the point is, is that I slap this person, this person is going to retaliate. Let's say I do it outside, they're still going to retaliate. And the point is, is that the relevant variables here, or the irrelevant variables are, you know, my clothes. My clothes don't matter. Uh, the, his clothes don't matter. This room, in fact, doesn't matter. The relevant variables are me and him, right? The, the, you know, you can argue well that the state of the world, given that maybe there's faculty in the room, people don't want to appear badly, those are uh, inhibitory factors, they're important, but I'm not going to talk about them at this instant. Uh, so this means that causality, to, to, is just to make it more formal, make everyone understand, causality consists of three points, which is state, outcome, and the any number of disruptive causes. But the most important thing is that there is only a single outcome. There's only one outcome for all of your events, all right? And that's what allows you to predict. All right, so since I mentioned probabilities, it's important to understand what probabilities actually are. Probabilities represent the lack of knowledge. There is, more specifically, they represent the lack of causal observability or causal knowledge. There is no why, as Yoda state, no more, no more law I teach you today. The point is, is that probabilities establish the bounds on outcomes, bounds on observable outcomes they don't observe the actual causal factors producing it. So you have your, your, your coin, it's 50-50%, uh, 50-50. Uh, those are your bounds of your outcomes. 
You can be, it can either be 50% heads, 50% tails. You don't understand the why if you actually understood or knew, let's say knew and could observe the, uh, the starting side, the, the rate of rotation, the, the trajectory, the speed, and the distance to the floor, wind speed, and all the other variables. You would know with certainty, with absolute certainty, what the, what the outcome would be. It would land in the same place, it would bounce the same way, and it would, you'd end up with the same uh, outcome, right? So, the, the other representation of uh, probability is that they, they represent error. That's the other view. And it's not the correct representation of error either. The example is a gravity example. Let's say I take a book. The book is, uh, I take it, I drop it. Three times, three times I drop it, it lands on the floor. Bam! All right? The fourth time I take this book, I let go of it, and nothing happens. Right? You might commit, uh, a person who believes probabilistically has a probabilistic model of the world might conclude that gravity only operates 75% of the time, or that the, that the gravity itself is, has some error factor of 75% of it, or maybe that it's only 75% observable. You might try to clutch Kludge's model to say that there's some hidden variable, but that's just a clutch. The point is, is that everybody here knows what actually happened to gravity. Something in the world interfered like a desk. And if you actually believe that the world is probabilistic, that the graphing only operates 75% of the time, go you. Um, I hope that when you're on a plane and the engine fails, that it's that you're lucky and that's that 70 or that 25% of the time, <laughs> right? But uh, uh, the point is, is that you add these here hidden variables, you add it so that you can reach probabilistic unity, and that is in fact not probable, not probability at all. It's just certainty, and you can't do that by accident, right? Or you can't do that in any unsupervised way with a probabilistic model. All right, so the, the last and probably the most important thing, I'm spending too much time on the slide, is that uh, probably the most important nail in the probabilistic coffin is that this idea of loss of state. If you have this experiment, this an experiment consists of uh, producing a set of six outcomes, A, B, C, D, E, F, those, and over and over again, A, B, C, D, E, F, over and over again. You can analyze this and you could say, well, there's 16% chance of A, 16% chance of F. You can also, that's equivalent to saying that there's 16% chance and 16% chance of A, 16% chance of F, and 16% chance of A, right? Those two representations are identical, they're fully commutative. And the problem is, is that you've taken what is essentially the linear state of your, of your black box, of your, of your experiment, and turned it into, or transformed it non-deterministically into this other representation. With that non-deterministic transform, you've lost the state, and without the, without the state, you can't induce the causality. As we just observed, state is, the is one of the most important things in causality, or one of, the, one of the important definitions. All right, so let's suppose that we want to induce causality. I'm not going to go into the actual axioms of how it works. Um, I'm just going to tell you what happens. So we want to internally replicate and maintain the determinism of the world's causality as an entity with incomplete observability. Right? And that's to state that you want to be able to predict exactly where the rock is going to fall when it's rolling down the hill so that you're not in its path. All right, so the result is, without going into the axioms, which are incredibly annoying and difficult and confusing, the, the result is that causal relations, if you believe that uh, learning causality, uh, that inducing causality is a representation of learning, that the observations or causal relations have to be learned outcome first. Right? That means that you have to observe the, the outcome of what happened rather than the cause first, the cause, it, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm not going to go into each of these. The, um, there's also the knowledge that has to be gained incrementally, which is to say one thing has to be changed at a time. As your mother told you, or uh, you know, some mothers in some worlds tell them, learn one step at a time. Right? Uh, as a related factor, or uh, as a related thing, that in, Inducing this causal model is exponential with the number of unknowns, which is to state if there are two unknown observables inside your, uh, that you're observing in the world, then you have four theories about how they were produced. If you have three, three unknowns, then there are eight theories. Four is 16. You have an exponential learning problem. If there's only one unknown learning incrementally, then you can learn and acquire this model in, in linear time. You can learn it and use it in linear time, which if you, uh, if you ever learned and you, you've been posed with a number of questions you're not able to answer, you just stuff that in your head to something you don't understand and then it slows you down every time you try to fix it, right? There's also, uh, there's also this idea of productive incorrect, uh, of incorrectness. Everybody here is productively incorrect, which is to state you are able to behave deterministically in the world even though your model for the world is not complete. It's not correct, right? That is, that is to state that you're able to predict what, ha what will happen with the world 100% of the time until the one time and where you're wrong. 
And when you're wrong, you then immediately try to understand why. You increase the sophistication of your model, and that allows you to become productively correct, again, given your data, your, given your observations. So you're productively correct. You're, you're correct given your data, but you're productively incorrect given an absolute scale uh, on the absolute world. Right? And the final thing that I'm going to touch on here is this knowledge of state. Um, as I was saying before, the, the knowledge of state is probably the most important thing about induction of causality. And I'm not actually going into it in any, uh, in any real de detail because of the sheer difficulty it is and the complexity of, of uh, understanding the laws and what happens with it. Right? But it is the most important thing. Um, well, maybe not the most important, but I, I if it is of the three most important things, right? Yeah. All right, so the last thing, I'll have a little picture here showing you what, what causality is. This is your outcome. You have three causes, and it's essentially just like living in, chi in China. There's only one child for any number of parents, although, you know, in practice, it's human, so there are only two parents, but maybe you have an extended family. Uh, anyway, the point is that, well, that's the point. <laughs> All right, so basically I want to, kind of, to conclude with an example, a determinism of knowledge. There's only one outcome for any particular cause. What that means is that your knowledge is converging. It's always converging to the outcome. That means that uh, here, here we have, um, uh, to, give, to give the example, uh, this is a consistent of Mr. Green and a Mr. Blue. I didn't actually give them names because I, I guess I'm kind of dumb sometimes. Uh, but Mr. Green has this internal knowledge base where either A or B causes C. If X causes A, Y causes B, there's any number of things between X and A. The point is, is Y does not cause A because the knowledge is converging. All right, he sees C, he's a curious cat, he wants to know what happened, right? So he's like, did A or B happen? Did A or B happen, right? So here comes along Mr. Blue. Mr. Blue has a very simple view of the world. He knows that W causes X, which causes Z. Um, and that would be before A, right? But he says he only observed X. So he says to him, hey, X occurred, right? And as a result, Mr. Green, he has an epiphany. His epiphany is, oh, A occurred, right? Because X caused A, right? Which caused C. He can, he can tell him any piece of information before A, and because of the convergence of knowledge, he will always be able to answer A, right? It doesn't matter what you tell him. Unless, of course, you tell him something that uh, implies Y or B, right? So to make this concrete, make, it, make the example more, more uh, palatable, more real world, we're going to take John kissed Mary, right? Let's suppose that you, Matt, let's suppose that you're married to Mary, okay? And someone comes along, let's say that the source is trustable. Uh, this is an important thing in uh, causality, the trustability of the source. But let's suppose that someone comes along and tells you, hey, John kissed Mary. John kissed your wife Mary, right? What do you care about? Right. You want to know whether or not Mary is cheating on you. That's exactly right. But now we want to back that up, and we want to ask a more concrete question based on this statement, which is... Did Mary kiss John back? Right? That's the same question. And so you have two theories. Mary either kissed John back, or Mary did not kiss John back. This is the same as this example. Now, you can answer this question with any number of other pieces of evidence. Let's suppose that I tell you, as a human, let's suppose that I tell you that uh, Mary is completely devoted to Matt. All right? Good job, Matt. Good. Great. What does that answer the question? Mary did not kiss John back. You know that with certainty. She's absolutely devoted. She will not do that. Let's suppose that instead I say, oh, Mary likes to kiss. She likes to kiss everybody. Mary's a big floozy. Oh, all of a sudden, you know that Mary kissed John back. Maybe you should seek some couples counseling that. All right? But, uh, you know, of course, it's a fictitious situation. It's your decision how to proceed given your fictitious uh, wife. Um, anyway, the point is, is that the determinism of knowledge uh, allows you to answer any question. This, of course, is not taking into account the idea of state, which is to state maybe maybe Mary was inebriated, or maybe Mary was uh, high on crystal meth. Don't you don't do drugs. Um, the point is is that state is extremely important. It changes the outcomes, but in a world where uh, where a simple causal with a, with this convergence of knowledge, you're able to answer any question given the given any number of prior information. Okay. And so that basically is my presentation. Uh, that's basically my research um, in its uh, most simple and <laughs> distilled form. Uh, and to conclude, my name once again is Baraki Ankama, Barack at MIT.edu. I'm located in the Status Center. All right, thank you. Um, for those who are interested, I'm going to show this, uh, show this search engine.
search engine thing, if I can actually start it. Uh, basically, to uh, give you the give you the background, this is these are distributed web crawlers. Basically, they go around the internet. They're controlled by the central server. Uh, any number of them can be running. They visit web pages and turn the web pages, turn the visual structure of the web pages into information trees. And it uses those information trees uh, to stick them. Originally, they were stuck into the neural networks and, and Bayesian networks while I was trying to figure out what was happening. And now they're being stuck into this uh, into this causal model, right? Uh, and nah, that's still being worked on. But the point is, any number of these can run. This is an open GL simulation, not simulation. This, this is actually running. It's actually running off the server control. All right. Okay, thank you. Oh, you can also do cool stuff with it too. <laughs>